For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Amen. Being a person of faith can be confusing at times. Let's just be honest. If we believe in God, we might find ourselves asking questions like, why me? Why is this bad thing happening to me? Why am I faced with this particular struggle? At the same time, we might wonder, what's in it for us? What's my reward for being a good, faithful person? Job is asking the first kind of question. All of these bad things have happened to Job. He's suffered mightily. So he asks God, why? Eventually, God responds, as we heard in our reading today. God doesn't exactly answer the question which is at the heart of the whole book of Job. Why do innocent or righteous people suffer? Instead, God says, look, I'm God and you're not. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the world? The question of suffering is a complicated question. And the fact that the writer of the book of Job was grappling with it 2,500 years ago reminds us that it's a timeless question. It's not new. When you ask God why, you're in good company. But God's answer to Job, tell me if you have understanding, reminds us that we don't believe in a God who causes suffering. We don't believe in a God who gives this person cancer or causes a car accident or even a hurricane. The fact is that in this mysterious and cosmic existence of which we are a tiny part, there is suffering. For whatever reason, it's part of the deal. So the question is, where is God? How do we stay connected to God and not lose our faith or hope in the midst of the suffering? And that's where for us as Christians, the coming of Christ is so important. Jesus, as we heard last week, has just told the rich man that he can't get close to God without getting rid of all of his possessions and giving the money to the poor. Now along come two of the disciples, the brothers, James and John, and they boldly say to their teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. Can you imagine the audacity? It only gets worse when we learn that what they want is power and prestige. Even after Jesus has told them three times that he is going to be crucified and die, they're thinking about their own best interests. Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. They demand. Jesus responds with a question. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? In other words, are you able to face what I've just been describing as my destiny? We are able, they recklessly reply. These two think that Jesus has a big victory coming up, a huge triumph, and so they're asking the second kind of question. What's in it for me? What's my reward for being a good person? Even after the rich man had been told he had to empty himself of what he owned, they want to know what they're going to get for being disciples. What Jesus is saying to these two confused disciples is that they're really asking the wrong question. It's not about glory for one individual. It's about building the kingdom of God. And if they want to be part of that work, they need to be ready to pour themselves out for others. When Jesus talked about his passion, the disciples got upset and Peter took him aside and criticized him. But Jesus said, you can't go around it. 
You have to go through it. God does not redeem us from suffering, but rather redeems us in our suffering. And the suffering to which Jesus submits himself in his limitless love for humanity is redemptive because it brings God into the very center of our suffering. God isn't above it all, above the struggles we face as humans. We weren't there when God laid the foundations of the earth, but God is here when we are hurting and confused and angry. The cross is at the center of every moment of pain. Like Job, we are meant to ask not why the innocent or the righteous suffer, but where God is for us in the suffering. And like James and John, we're asked by Jesus to take another step if we truly want to share in his glory, his real glory, not the time-bound, earthly power glory the two of them were thinking about. Yes, God is with us in our suffering, and that is a source of great comfort. Yes, God offers us salvation in Christ, but God also calls us to a ministry of servanthood. Whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. If you want to be with me, Jesus says, you have to be ready to give and give and give. Because there is no kingdom, there's no reward until it includes everyone. And getting there is a long, hard road. God redeems us in our suffering. Jesus gives his life as a ransom for ours for a purpose, to transform us into disciples. James and John asked to be at his right hand and at his left hand in his glory. Well, we know who ends up at his right hand and at his left hand. The two criminals. In the critical moment, the disciples all desert him and run away in fear for their own lives. And Jesus is there dying on the cross with broken, desperate people on either side of him. And what do they receive? Grace, mercy, forgiveness. What's in it for us? Grace, life, in the fullness of our humanity, in the most wretched places in our souls. What's in it for us is life and the limitless love of God. And happiness. And happiness. <laughs> James and John asked the question <clears throat> for the wrong reason, but in a way it's the right question. What's in it for us? The blessed assurance that we are beloved, wanted, precious in the sight of God. The confidence to face whatever comes, to encounter even suffering with faith, knowing that we are safe in the presence of the one who was crucified. Charlotte Eliot, in her beautiful poem, which is a favorite hymn we'll sing in a bit, wrote, Just as I am, poor, wretched, blind, sight, riches, healing of the mind, yea, all I need in thee to find, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. All I need in him to find. There's so much blessing for us and for all who come to know and love God in Christ. Let us pray that as a church we will grow in our ability to embrace this blessing and especially to make it known to others. Amen. Amen.